So this uh, week and on Tuesday, we'll be looking at the topic of free will. Today, we will look uh, at three basic uh, issues. First, again, introduce the problem. What is the problem of free will? Um, and look at some of the kind of answers to the problem. And then today, we'll be uh, trying to look at solutions to one of the questions that crops up in the problem of free will. And that's about the truth of determinism. Um, and we'll look at hard determinism and libertarianism. Um, and they both have different views on the truth of determinism. All right, so what is the problem of free will? So when we talked about the mind, one of the things that kind of immediately uh, uh, jumps out is that we have a, a very kind of familiar relationship with consciousness, with our, mo- with our own minds. And so in the same way, we kind of have an intimate relationship with uh, our, our making of choices, uh, willing things to happen. Um, so, you know, the, the, the idea of, of making a decision is something that happens every day, um, and it involves mundane facts to the more, you know, uh, uh, momentous questions, um, and it can involve kind of immediate decisions or much more of a thought-out process. Um, they all have this, the, the kind of common uh, experience of, of weighing reasons, right? You're trying to make a decision for or against something. Um, and often if you kind of ask somebody after the fact, right, so you've made a decision, and then you ask them, well, if you could do it all over again, could you have chosen differently? Not that would you have chosen differently. I mean, maybe they had really good reasons to, to choose one action over another. But the question is, you know, if, if you really wanted to, right, if you just, uh, for, for, you know, something like it, uh, uh, on a whim, if you wanted to, to, to choose differently, could you have, uh, most people would say, yeah, sure, I could have chosen differently. Um, so there's, you know, there's nothing that forces you to say wear one outfit over another. Uh, so if you had to do the day all over again, you know, and it turned out that somebody else was wearing the same outfit you were, uh, you're kind of like, oh, damn, I need to, I should have picked something different. You could have. Um, so again, it seems that we have an intuitive feel for us acting freely. It's one of those things that it's just, it just seems so kind of commonsensical. Um, so just as with the mind, the kind of uh, gut reaction that most people have is like, yeah, of course I have free will. I can do it all the time. I make decisions all the time. I make choices all the time. What's the problem? Well, but on the other hand, we have kind of a, uh, uh, an understanding of the universe and ourselves as part of the universe that has been uh, developed over the years thanks to uh, the, the, sec- the, the success of the natural sciences. Um, so it's kind of more commonplace today to think of human beings as more or less just uh, another part of nature, right? We're not in any sense different than uh, most of the other stuff around us. I mean, the, we're all made of the same basic uh, elements in the periodic table. We all abide by the same universal physical laws. So there's real no uh, major difference in kind between, say, human being, other animals, and even other kind of inanimate things. Um, so if the laws of nature um, determine uh, the kind of actions of the other parts of the universe, right? We all think that the laws of nature may determine uh, certain mechanical processes. Then it seems that if we're subject to those very same laws, they should also determine us. Um, So even though we kind of learn about the scientific conception of the world uh, differently than we may learn about our own uh, volitional choices, um, it seems that it's just as certain um, in not a kind of Cartesian sense of certain, but we have pretty good evidence to believe that we are uh, as equally kind of subject to the natural laws as anything else. So, again, we have these kind of two beliefs that we want to hold on to. Uh, On the one hand, we have a belief in human freedom. So, again, we could have chosen differently. We make choices all the time. Um, 
we uh, freely bring about a course of action. Um, and this is apparent to us through introspection. Um, but on the other hand, we believe in a kind of natural conception of human beings. Um, that human beings are natural organisms subject to all the same physical laws that everything else is. So if we kind of think other things are determined because of uh, natural laws, then it seems that we should also think of ourselves as determined by those natural laws. So we have two plausible beliefs that uh, most of us probably hold simultaneously side by side. But this creates a conflict, right? Unfortunately, not all of the beliefs that we hold are consistent with one another. It's often the case that our, our beliefs are massively inconsistent. So in this particular instance, we have uh, the, the, the conflict between thinking ourselves free intuitively and understanding ourselves as just other parts of nature that are determined by the same physical laws. So how can these both be true, or are they both, be, or, or, are they both true? And this is where you get the problem of free will and determinism. So the problem of free will is kind of this clash of two uh, more or less basic beliefs that we, we have about ourselves. Our uh, common sense notion of freedom versus our uh, learned notion of the kind of nature of ourselves. Um, we want to accept both, but there seems to be an inconsistency between the two. But that's not to say that there is an inconsistency because, as we'll come back next week, we'll look at a position called compatibilism that says there's actually not a conflict between the two. Um, but the, the problem of free will and determinism can be broken down into two separate questions. So the first question, is causal determinism true? Uh, and the second question is, is determinism compatible with free will? So one can answer uh, each question differently depending on the position you take. So the, the kind of first question about is determinism true uh, more or less is an empirical question, right? It, it will ultimately depend on the kind of physical laws that um, we, we kind of develop when, you know, someday we have a theory of everything. Um, and question two, though, is, is often thought to be more properly philosophical question because it's looking at uh, whether or not the notion of freedom can in some, ha some sense uh, still be uh, operative in a deterministic universe. Um, and a lot of times these, kind of, these two separate issues are, are carried out independently of one another. Um, so kind of a question uh, or an answer to question two would say something like, well, if determinism turns out to be true, is it or isn't it consistent with freedom? So they don't make a kind of uh, a categorical statement initially saying, okay, determinism is true. Is it compatible with freedom? It's more, well, perhaps it is, perhaps it isn't. Let's suppose it is, and then we'll kind of work out to see if it is uh, a, a compatible with, with free will. And then once we have the, f the full information about the, the laws of nature, whether they're deterministic or not, um, we can then finally see if that conditional that we've set up turns out to be true. Um, in a little bit, I'll come back to what exactly is meant by determinism in, in this context. Um, so with these kind of two questions, you can kind of uh, outline a, uh, a table of different options. So you have uh, at the top the, the question two, whether or not uh, determinism is compatible with free will. So on the left, there are those who believe that it's incompatible. So these, uh, these positions are called incompatibilist positions. Uh, and then on the right, uh, there are those who think it is compatible, so creatively they call themselves compatibilists. Um, then on the left-hand column, you have uh, the question whether or not determinism is true. So depending on how you answer those two questions, that determines your kind of position in the, the uh, possibility space of, of 
answers to the free will problem. So today, we're going to look at um, two positions that think free will is incompatible with determinism. But they differ over the question of whether or not determinism is true. So today, we will be looking at the question number one, and then next week, we will look at question number two. Um, So those who think that determinism is true, remember, both, both believe that determinism is incompatible with free will. So those who believe that determinism is true are called hard determinists. And those who think that determinism is false are called libertarians about free will. Now, one should always keep in mind that the notion of libertarianism that's operating within the free will discussion, uh, I don't want to say has nothing in common with the political notion of libertarianism, but uh, they're two separate, separate positions. So if you find yourself agreeing with a libertarian <coughs> in, in, the, in the free will lecture, that doesn't make you a fan of Ayn Rand automatically. So, you know, might, that might worry some people. Um, you know, I don't want to make any general claims about Ayn Rand, but that's just in case people are worried. Um, so, okay, so today we'll look at these two possible solutions to the first question of whether or not determinism is true. Um, so, first we'll look at uh, hard determinism. All right, so what is the position of hard determinism? So, hard determinism is made up of two claims. One, determinism is true, and two, determinism is incompatible with free will. So those are the two answers to the two questions um, of the free will problem. So if one's a hard determinist, then that means there's no such thing as free will. Free will does not exist. Um, So any appearance that we make free choices is an illusion. Um, Now... If one also thinks that, say, something like moral responsibility requires free will, then, strictly speaking, on the hard determinist position, no one is morally responsible for any of their actions. Um, But, of course, it also means that nobody is... uh, So, basically, you can't praise or blame anyone for what they do. So, you can't... Uh, you know, scold someone, oh, you shouldn't have done that, you should have done something differently, nor can you uh, praise somebody for what they did. Because, again, their actions are determined. So it's really not up to them what they did. Um, So, in a sense, this problem uh, for for moral responsibility uh, has kind of made this position unpopular uh, amongst philosophers. Because most would agree that the, the ability to hold people morally responsible for their actions is an important thing, um, not, even, not just for theoretical reasons, but primarily for practical societal reasons. Um, but again, one should always keep in mind that just because there might be negative practical consequences, supposedly negative pra- practical consequences for some view, that doesn't mean it's false. So the hard determinist who could just kind of bite the bullet and say, yeah, moral responsibility is bankrupt. So what? Right? Like, it doesn't change the fact that the hard determinism is true. Um, But this also is a good uh, good example of how often more or less abstract philosophical reasoning has direct practical consequences, right? So the notion of free will uh, or discussions about how much control one has over oneself has already made its way into, say, the legal system. So uh, you get people coming in and, and testifying the idea that, well, look, based on their genetic history and the environment they grew up in, it was kind of almost inevitable that they became... Uh, a criminal or a murderer. Um, and so a lot of these issues have real-world consequences that have already been felt in, in the legal system. Um, so even though 
We're not going to touch too much on the applied aspect of this problem. It is kind of good to see how, you know, something that one may say of oh, philosophical theorizing is kind of, you know, idle navel gazing. Uh, but here's a real, in a real sense, uh, how it can have practical consequences. <clears throat> All right, so since we're looking at the question of whether or not determinism is true, we need to get clear on just what determinism means. Um, now, kind of the first, the most basic uh, aspect of determinism says something like every event has a cause. So events just don't happen. Right? They don't just come about. There's always a, a, a cause or multiple causes, depending on your view of causation, for uh, whatever happened. Um, and the second is these causes and every causal relationship follows the, the laws of nature. So here's kind of like a overly technical, impress your, 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 your friend's definition of determinism. So for any state of the world at some time, T1, uh, and, and some other state of the world some other time, call it T2, the conjunction, so bringing together, the state of the world at T1 plus the laws of nature necessitates the state of the world at T2. Um, so, basically, you have some uh, initial state of the universe, right? So, some organization of matter. You have the laws of nature, which basically determines how that, that system will unfold. Then, whatever time comes after it will be strictly necessitated by the, the previous time. So, kind of a way to, to, to think about it is, if determinism is true of this universe, then if we kind of rewound the clock of the universe and we hit play, the same events would happen, right? Because we'd start with uh, the same kind of physical conditions that we started with in our kind of actual timeline, and then we would start with the same laws of nature. So if you rewound it and hit play, the same things would happen. Um, but it's also important to separate determinism from two issues that often get conflated with it. So the first one is predictability. Um, and there's a, a great uh, quote from a French mathematician named Pierre Laplace. Um, he, he talked about, uh, it's, it's often called Laplace's demon, that, look, if there was some kind of super intelligence and they knew everything about every single piece of matter in the universe, everything about all the laws of nature, then they could predict with 100% certainty all future events. But again, determinism is a view about metaphysics. It's a view about the world. Predictability is about our ability to know the world. So we may lack certain information. Certainly, we aren't super intelligent creatures, although we like to think ourselves uh, such, um, that we will never be in a state of perfect knowledge. So the future event will always seem somewhat uncertain given initial conditions. But that doesn't mean that deterministic processes aren't involved. So you often hear um, people appealing to something like chaos theory. Um, which basically says uh, small changes to an initial state lead to drastic consequences later on. Um, this is where you often hear, like, oh, a butterfly flaps his wings and, uh, in Ohio and a hurricane hits um, somewhere in Africa. Um, but the whole idea is, technically speaking, chaotic systems are deterministic. So... A kind of classic example of a chaotic system is a, uh, a pool table that small changes in how you kind of, you, you, the trajectory of, of the, the, the billiard ball lead, leads, up, leads to dramatic changes in where it ends up. But, you know, one would look at a billiard, billiard table and go, there's nothing kind of indeterministic about that. So, 
It's always important not to confuse determinism with epistemic limitation. Uh, and then also, determinism is not the same thing as fatalism. So fatalism is kind of, you know, the view like, oh, well, if everything's determined, what does it matter what I do, right? It's all going to happen anyway. I might as well just sit back and, you know, let things happen. But fatalism kind of makes the mistake that it doesn't, con- it doesn't think that you're an important part of the causal chain. So even though, if determinism is true, what happens tomorrow is determined. But you might be an essential part in bringing about that state that's determined. So if you didn't do what you were ever going to do later today and early tomorrow, that future state wouldn't come about. So fatalism, which no matter what you do, some event's going to happen tomorrow, is different than determinism, which says, okay, tomorrow's going to come about, but you have to kind of, you're, you're an important causal agent in that, uh, in that chain of events. It's just that you didn't freely choose those actions that led to that future state. So that's just to get kind of clear on what determinism is and how to separate it from issues that are often confused with it. Um, so what then is the argument in favor of hard determinism? Well, Again, let's assume that free will, for the time being, that free will is incompatible with determinism. So why think determinism is true? And the kind of overwhelming evidence that past hard determinists had appealed to uh, was something like, well, look, again, we've just, with all the kind of information we've gotten from the various sciences, it's just hard to deny that the world is determined, right? So we have the kind of uh, uh, past mechanical picture of the world, and given the fact that uh, materialism is true, then we kind of, determinism just kind of falls out of that. So the kind of of guy that we'll talk about today is Baron de Albach, um, and he, uh, during the 18th century, he was kind of a... uh, he was, he was definitely a materialist, and he was a firm proponent of the scientific worldview. Um, and again, this means, in a materialist universe, that human beings themselves are also materialists. So there's no, again, there's no dualism of any kind. It's just matter. And since we're made of matter, that everything else is, we again follow the rules, the laws of nature, that determines how matter uh, behaves. Um, and uh, at least for Dahlbeck, right, that the, the laws of nature um, that nature follows are something like Newtonian mechanics. So, you know, the law of universal gravitation um, that some of you may have learned in physics, we're subject to that just as much as everything else. Um, so human beings are determined material entities just like any other physical system. So even though we feel like we have, we're making choices, since we learn f- through, through a scientific picture of the world what we're made of and how that stuff behaves because of the laws of nature, that means we ourselves are subject to those same rules. And if those and everything else in nature is determined, that means we are determined as well. So here's kind of a nice, uh, a nice quote from... Uh, Dolbach's kind of major work, System of Nature. So he says, Man's life is a line that nature commands him to describe upon the surface of the earth without his ever being able to swerve from it, even for an instant. He is born without his own consent. His organization is no wise dependent upon himself. His ideas come to him involuntarily. His habits are in the power of those who cause him to contract them. He is unceasingly modified by causes, whether visible or concealed, over which he has no control, which necessarily regulate his mode of existence, give the hue to his way of thinking, and determine his manner of acting. He is good or bad, happy or miserable, wise or foolish, reasonable or irrational, without his will being for anything in in these various states. Nevertheless, uh, and despite of the, the shackles by which he is bound, it is pretended he is a free agent, or that, 
independent of the causes by which he is moved, he determines his own will and regulates his own condition. So the kind of the, the majority of it is about, look, here's the actual nature of human beings. And this is what we've learned from the various sciences, physics, chemistry, biology. Now you can kind of point to neuroscience, psychology. It's kind of like all, the, all this evidence is piling up. Um, and so it's, it's kind of hard to ignore anymore. But yet we kind of still persist in believing that we have free will. And he's kind of hinting that it's because of our own ignorance. Again, since we're limited beings, especially perhaps about our own selves, that we are unaware of the kind of full range of causes that brings about our action. So not only our unconscious uh, thought processes that kind of largely determine our conscious thoughts, but also the kind of the physical environment that's constantly impinging on us, that's determining not only what we see, hear, smell, and so forth, but how that interacts with our own physical system and then brings about an action. So free will, technically then, is just an illusion perpetrated by the ignorance of the causes that bring about how we act. Now, one kind of major difficulty that people have with believing in this kind of hard determinism is, again, uh, the consequences it would have for morality. So, again, since we're kind of assuming that free will is incompatible with determinism and a moral responsibility seems to require the existence of free will, then the absence of free will means the absence of moral responsibility. Um, now, one could always redefine moral responsibility to try to make it fit within a, uh, a deterministic system. And next week, when we look at compatibilists, that's co- perhaps an option that's available to them. Right? So maybe the old notion of moral responsibility that we had has to go, but we can kind of re-engineer a new way of holding people more responsible given the truth of, of uh, determinism. So, the question is, can we really live our lives without holding people more responsible? Could we, in fact, eliminate moral responsibility um, from our interaction with other people? And at, this kind of leads a lot of even hard determinists or hard determinist sympathizers to try to find the most minimal parts of moral responsibility that can kind of be saved and incorporated into a determinist system. Um, there are those who think that actually it would be better if we got rid of this kind of old notion of moral responsibility. They actually think that the old kind of notion of, of, of how we praise and blame people based on the notion of free will is actually more detrimental than it would if we kind of got rid of it. So somebody like, uh, in, in, at least in history philosophy, somebody like Friedrich Nietzsche has this kind of idea. Right? He thinks that uh, morally praising and blaming people is just based on an error in our reasoning. Because, again, we think we have free will. But getting rid of the kind of system of moral responsibility that's founded on uh, uh, the notion of free will will actually free us in a, in a kind of, uh, not in a, a free will sense, but it will kind of take off a certain uh, pressure that society puts places upon us, um, and that we, we, we think we fail to live up to certain expectations that we should be able to achieve. But if we take that expectation away, then each person can kind of be who, as he says, you know, become who you are. So you are a certain way, and you can kind of become that way finally if we get rid of this prejudice. Um, But again, since the practical limitations of hard determinism aren't the same thing as its truth or falsity, this is not a kind of definitive uh, argument against the truth of hard determinism. It is a worry and it's something that hard determinists would have to kind of deal with. Um, 
But it doesn't mean hard determinism is wrong. Now, when we're considering the truth of hard determinism, the biggest uh, uh, kind of stumbling block for it is the contemporary scientific worldview. So a lot of the hard determinists um, were arguing prior to the, the advent of 20th century physics. Um, I mean, this is especially true for Dahlbach, Nietzsche. Um, and for, for them, the kind of scientific paradigm they were operating in was mecha- mechanistic and deterministic, right? There were no exceptions to Newton's laws, and it was, you know, perfect in terms of its determinism. But in the 20th century, we come across, you know, the strange world of quantum mechanics. Um, and it's not quite certain anymore whether determinism is still true. So you, you have some people arguing that indeterminism um, is, is, is actually true, that some events just happen. They don't have causes. Um, so things like radioactive decay or uh, when electrons change energy levels uh, between their orbits around a, a, a nucleus, these things just happen. Just, they just happen. There's no kind of prior causal chain that leads to them just coming about. Um, so because of this kind of uncertainty, empirical uncertainty about the truth of determinism, this is perhaps why many philosophers stick with the, the issue of compatibilism because it's somewhat independent of whether or not determinism is true. Um, but there are some, I think um, a temporary philosopher named Ted Honderich, I think, uh, he kind of says, all right, even if indeterminism reigns at a quantum level, when, at the level we're concerned with, right, at the level of human beings, that kind of indeterminism disappears. So sometimes you'll hear it as, you know, it's determinist enough, or it's determinism where it counts. So even if indeterminism is true about the laws of physics in general, that doesn't necessarily vindicate um, uh, indeterminism at a level where it becomes relevant to us and our actions. Um, And so that's one of the kind of debates that's ongoing about determinism versus indeterminism. Um, Some people call themselves hard incompatibilists today rather than hard determinists because of this worry about the falsity of determinism, but they still think there's there's no free will, uh, even if, say, quantum mechanics turns out to be indeterministic. Um, And that's that's just to say, look, you know, you know, this is not a class about quantum mechanics or anything, so there's no, nobody expects you to know anything about it. But if you've, you know, kind of heard the whole idea that quantum mechanics has proven that indeterminism is true, that's not. That's, that's, that's strictly speaking, that's BS, right? Those are certain interpretations of quantum mechanics that just happen to, I don't know, be the more fantastic ones that people like to put on television programs. Um, so... It's usually a good idea just to kind of stick away from appealing to quantum mechanics in, in arguments, because most of the time it's going to be wrong. But there are those who think that indeterminism is true, and this is what allows us to have free will. And, that, and, and that's who we'll come to next. So these are the libertarians. The libertarians disagree with the hard determinists uh, that, that determinism is true. But they agree that if determinism were true, this would rule out free will. So they're both incompatibilists, yet uh, the libertarians believe we do have free will, and that's because indeterminism is true. Um, So they do this by, again, denying the truth of determinism. So their answer to question number one, is determinism is true, is no. Um, and I guess their name, libertarianism, comes from you know liberty. The, in, the, the, the falsity of determinism gives us liberty, um, and so on. So 
we'll look at, there are lots of different types of libertarianism. So, but the one we're going to look at today is called an agent causal theory um, of libertarianism, and it's kind of uh, most famously developed by an American philosopher named Roderick Chisholm. Uh, he, in his essay, where Human Freedom and the Self, he, he kind of gives a pretty good uh, explanation of what it is. Um, this, this essay is kind of, you probably could find it online, but it's also in quite a few free will uh, uh, edited collections. It's a, it's a pretty well-known paper. So he argues, unsurprisingly for libertarianism, for, for libertarian, that free will is incompatible with determinism. But surprisingly, he also thinks that free will is incompatible with certain types of indeterminism. So a kind of a chance occurrence that's, that's kind of beyond one's control, uh, uh, that, that may be the result of past action, is not something that I freely choose. Right? So a muscle spasm uh, does not mean that I have freely willed that to happen, even though it may be completely indeterministic. So indeterminism doesn't automatically mean we have free will. Right? It has to be kind of a specific type of indeterminism for Chisholm before we can actually gain free will. All right, so first we'll look at what he thinks free will is not before we can get to what he actually considers free will to be. So if my action is the result of external forces, then it's not free. Right? So you know, you can think of if somebody forces you to pull the trigger of a gun because they have, you know, they have their hand around your hand and they, they push your hand in, you're not responsible for that action because somebody, an external force, compelled you to do it. Um, so again, you're not held responsible. So even though you may be causally responsible and to some extent, you were not, it was not the result of your free choice, because something, an external event compelled you. So it's not considered a free act. <clears throat> but Ch Chisholm goes even further and says that if things are kind of the necessary outcome of certain desires and beliefs, they're not free either. And that's because the kind of a desire and a belief is like the internal equivalent of an external event. Uh, mainly because we, we really don't choose our desires. Our desires just kind of happen to us. Um, if, you kind of, if you kind of think of a desire like a passion, then the very kind of root word for passion reflects that. So passion uh, comes from the Greek, I think, pathe, which means something that afflicts you. So it's something that kind of, kind of comes over you rather than you kind of bring about. So a desire, a passion, is already something that is beyond one's control in its very kind of conception. So, you know, if I have a real strong desire to, to shoot another person, I don't know why I picked that. <laughs> I don't know why I picked that example. Maybe I was really angry when I, when I wrote the lecture. But I don't have any desire to shoot anyone, so, you know, don't worry. <laughs> um, Maybe it's just because it's such a stark example. I don't, um, but yeah, if I have like a really strong desire to, to shoot someone, and this, because of the strength of my, my desire, there's kind of no other possibility that I would, I would you know, not actually shoot that person, then it's not a result of my free action. So here's, here's a quote from Chisholm. It makes no difference whether the cause of the deed was internal or external. If the cause was some state or event for which the man himself was not responsible, then he was not responsible for what we have been mistakenly calling his act. Right? So we kind of, we, it, it makes sense to say ex, you know, certain external events are, are, are not the result of our choosing. Lots of things happen to us. It's not our fault. But I guess where Chisholm's kind of going even further is saying that even certain internal states about us we didn't freely bring about like desires and maybe some beliefs there's just kind of this automatic I mean if you really reflect on what you desire 
You know, can you really pinpoint the fact that you chose that desire? Desire seems to be something that just kind of, we just have. Um, and that's, that's basically Chisholm's point. So, how then does Chisholm think we get free will? So, there's no event, event causal chain can actually uh, result in an action. Any event causal chain is determined, whether that event is internal or external. So, certain types of indeterminacy are insufficient for free will, and they could even diminish our control, right? Like the, the, the random muscle spasm. So his solution to the problem is he introduces two different notions of causation. Um, now, because philosophers like being difficult, he goes back and he uses a, I think, a medieval term that I can't even pronounce, transient, transient causation. So anyway, this is the kind of causation that doesn't really matter the name, as long as you understand the concept. It's the kind of causation that's involved in, you know, most of the things we think of as causal chains, right? So a rock breaking a window, right? So the rock hitting the plane of glass, the, the glass shattering, this kind of causal chain is the, the, the notion of his first type of causation. So it's the one that we're perhaps most familiar with if we think of causation. But he also comes up with a second definition, or second type of causation, he calls imminent causation. And this is a peculiar kind of causation that only agents have. So agents are of a different kind of ontological kind than, you know, a rock hitting a window. Agents are unique in having imminent causation. And an imminent cause is something that causes something else to happen. So it brings about some other state, but that cause itself was uncaused by something else. So it's kind of a, it's it's, it's an originating cause rather than the result of something else. That's why it's strictly speaking an indetermined cause because one one of the conditions for determinism was that every event has a cause. So if this, uh, if this cause, this, this imminent cause, is uncaused, if it doesn't have something that brought it about, it's indeterministic. So, and this is the kind of cause that's different than a random kind of spasm of the arm that Chisholm thinks gives us free will. So he thinks that we, as agents, have a particular type of causation that allows us to have free will. Now, one way to kind of it's, 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 a, it's a pretty kind of mysterious notion, and one way to kind of gra- grasp it uh, is with something like Aristotle's notion of, of a prime mover. Um, so a prime mover for Aristotle is something that sets the world on its path, but itself is unmoved. Sometimes you hear it, the, the unmoved mover. Um, and the prime mover for Aristotle is his, his way of, of, of getting around the infinite regress of causes that would need to bring about the existence of the world. So, for Aristotle, the prime mover is something like God. That, you know, in the kind of classical cosmological argument, you have, well, everything has a cause. Well, that means the universe has to have a cause. What's that, what's that cause? Well, it would have to be God. But then you ask this further question, well, then what caused God if everything has to have a cause? And Aristotle goes, well, God's of a certain distinct nature, right? God is the, the unmoved mover or the uncaused cause of the world. Um, so in a way, although Chisholm doesn't explicitly say this, we're kind of like many gods. <laughs> so that may be, I don't know, pretty, pretty cool for a view, but it just means that we can initiate a series of cause, cause, causal chains without that initiating act itself being caused. So, in that, in that sense, we're an unmoved mover, but not in the you know, full-blown uh, uh, Aristotelian sense that we brought about the universe, although that would be pretty cool. Um, you know, it really just means that we're the god of our hands or something like that, right? Our domain of control is pretty limited. Um, 
But you could ask, well, you know, that still really doesn't help us understand imminent causation, Chisholm. You know, we're, we're still pretty confused about just how uh, an act can be uncaused, yet cause other things. Because you could say that that action just kind of spontaneously comes about. It's kind of just, you know, if, it's, if, if, if the act that initiates a certain movement of, of my body or something else uh, is uncaused, then what's the difference between conce- conceiving that cause as just spontaneously emerging uh, rather than directed by an agent? So, again, it seems that imminent causation is an example of the type of indeterminism that Chisholm thought wasn't sufficient for free will. Remember, it's that kind of just the spasm of the arm. We're not in control of that, so how could we be responsible? But if this kind of uncaused action or thought or whatever is what's determining a causal chain, but it itself is not the cause of anything, then how is that any different than just a random happening, right? We have a a thought just kind of pops into our heads and it makes us move. That doesn't seem like much, much control. Um, so sometimes in the literature you hear, you're, you're, you'll hear, hear talk, uh, people talk about uh, the idea of luck. It's kind of like the action is just luck. It's just a matter, of, it's a matter of chance that it comes about. And that's not sufficient for control, which is really what we want for free will. Now, Chisholm kind of responds to this worry by saying, well, look, even a causation, sure, it's mysterious. But then causation is, in general is mysterious. So, you know, if I am going to go down with the ship, so are you. Um, but he even goes further. He goes, for, he goes further and says, imminent causation is actually more uh, readily understood by people than uh, the other kind of causation. Because what we're familiar with first is how we bring about states of the world. And then once we kind of develop that notion of cause and effect, I have some thought, I bring about an event, then I can, kind of, I can kind of determine cause and effect relationships outside of myself. So it's actually imminent causation that's prior in explanation than uh, transient causation. So he says, if we did not understand the concept of imminent causation, we would not understand that of transient causation. Now, you know, this is a pretty... Uh, a substantive claim, um, and we're not going to go into whether or not it's correct, uh, but that's just a way that perhaps Chisholm can kind of respond to this worry. But then there's the further difficulty with agent causation in that the metaphysical cost would be too high because it seems that agent causation requires some kind of mental dualism. Of course, it's not completely the interactionist kind that we saw with Descartes, because the agent that's causing other states, it itself is not caused by, uh, say, physical states of the body. So causation for Chisholm is only one way. It's only agent to body to outside world, something like that. Um, and so in a way, the agent has to be above the normal physical ca- causal chain. It can... It can instantiate a causal chain, but it's not subject to it. But this means that the agent is somehow above the kind of normal laws of nature. But the only way it could do that is is if it's of a type of stuff that's not material. Because all material stuff plays by the same rules. Um, And this, of course, brings back all the kind of dualistic problems that we discussed with, with, with dualism. So you can kind of say, well, one, on the one hand, there may, no be, there, there may not be any kind of evidence that there is an agent like this, this kind of this, this, uh, agent that can bring about a state, of, a state of affairs that itself is not the result of a cause. But even if there's no kind of decisive evidence in favor of it, we could say the cost of accepting an agent like this is too high. So we have to kind of say, well, maybe on a cost-benefit analysis, absent any kind of definitive proof of this kind of agent, it may not be the best course of action. So even though, so again, it's kind of like weighing up options. So with hard determinism, you know, it may be true because it makes, 
It makes the most sense with any kind of scientific worldview. But on the other hand, the cost is uh, perhaps it undermines our notion of moral responsibility. Whereas for Asian causation, uh, libertarianism, it, it makes sense of our uh, notion of free will, that we can kind of be the initiators of some act. But the cost is that it may be quite revisionary of, of our kind of scientific picture of the world. And so you just have to weigh up the options that you want to take uh, in your kind of views about this topic. But these, of course, aren't the only two solutions to the problem. So next week, we'll look at compatibilism that seems to, uh, in a way, try to have the best of both worlds. Today, we'll finish up the uh, discussion on free will and determinism. Um, and we'll be focusing particularly on two topics, um, compatibilism and incompatibilism. So just as kind of a, a very brief recap of what we went over last time, um, the question that we looked at was uh, whether or not determinism is true. So again, most people uh, agree that the, the final uh, answer to this problem about determinism will be somewhat of an empirical question based on um, our kind of best sciences, not just in physics, but um, of course things like uh, chemistry, biology, psychology, neuroscience. So even if, say, um, on, a, on a quantum level things are indeterminate, it may not be indeterminate at a level of, say, the brain, which is really where it counts when we're talking about <clears throat> the decisions that we make. Um, so just pointing to indeterminism in, in the world is not enough. You have to kind of pinpoint it at the proper level. Um, now, we looked at two positions that took opposing views on the question about the truth of determinism. So on the one hand, there were the hard determinists who thought determinism is, was true, and then there were the libertarians who thought determinism was false. Um, and we, we only looked at one kind of particular version of libertarianism. That's the agent causal picture of libertarianism. So that was Roderick Chisholm's view. Um, so that the hard determinists say, well, because determinism is true, we have no free will. Um, the libertarians say, well, because determinism is false, we actually do have free will. But then they have to give an account of how indeterminism still allows for free choice. Um, because, you know, pure indeterminism, pure chance really is not enough for, for uh, an action to be free. Right? We wouldn't consider just random events or random behaviors to be freely chosen. Um, so there were kind of drawbacks to both positions. Hard determinism um, left us kind of in a somewhat pessimistic position where, well, if free, if free will is, is, is false, um, then this seems to rule out things like moral responsibility, which is really important for, for basically the functioning of society. Um, libertarianism, because they allow free will, uh, you can kind of make sense of moral responsibility, but the metaphysical picture that they had was somewhat uh, questionable. Um, but both agreed on the other question that's part of the, the discussion about free will. So both agreed that determinism is incompatible with free will. And that means if determinism is true of the world, then that rules out free will. So they both take an incompatibilist position. Um, so in a sense, you know, you could say things don't look too good for free will either. You know, the, the hard determinists are right and this kind of rules out free will and moral responsibility. Or the libertarians are right, at least about the indeterminism. And it seems to kind of, uh, it doesn't really make sense of, of what we want for free will. Um, so another alternative is to say, well, instead of you know, denying determinism being true, what we should deny is that determinism is incompatible uh, with free will. That is, both can be true at the same time. Um, so in a sense, you can kind of overcome the shortcomings of both positions. So quite 
creatively, those people who think that free will is compatible with, with determinism call themselves compatibilists. Um, sometimes you'll also re- re- refer it, uh, hear it referred to as soft determinism. So this is uh, how you can contrast it with hard determinism. Some hard determinism. So both the compatibilists or soft determinists and the hard determinists agree that determinism is true, where they disagree is over the question of compatibility. So that's what makes the compatibilist a soft version of determinism. So the truth of determinism is no longer a threat to the existence of free will. Um, you can already see how this could be a, uh, uh, a benefit uh, over hard determinism because it would allow us to make sense of uh, moral discourse. Um, and so it kind of, it again, it meshes with our two intuitive principles that we looked at last time. On the one hand, uh, it, it, it basically says we're correct, right? We do have free choice. We have free will. Um, when we're engaged in deliberation, we are acting freely. So it kind of, it, it vindicates our um, kind of initial understanding of ourselves, and the practice of ascribing moral responsibility. But on the other hand, because it at least says, okay, determinism may be true, or determinism is true where it counts, perhaps at the level of brain, um, it tries to incorporate itself into a scientific worldview. So it doesn't require us to uh, make any kind of extravagant metaphysical claims, the one that we kind of saw with uh, the agent view of, of libertarianism, that there's you know, some kind of uh, unique form of causation that agents have uh, that might require something like substance dualism. Um, so it seems that this is the, in the best of both worlds, right? On the one hand, we still get to keep free will. On the other hand, we don't have to have any high metaphysical costs, right? We can kind of say, we can, we can easily just accept the standard scientific picture of the world and ourselves in that world. Um, And so, and I haven't looked at the the data recently, um, but I'd be willing to bet that the majority of contemporary philosophers would classify themselves as compatibilists. Um, And, you know, the, the apparent advantages of the view, it's kind of easy to see why um, this would be a very attractive position. Um, but again, just as in with, you know, say, quality of music, popularity doesn't mean that it's a true position. Um, so, you know, just because all these authority figures say, yeah, compatible is awesome because we can have everything we possibly want, um, it may be true good to be true. So we'll kind of look at that today. Um, Maybe compatibilism is kind of the philosophical equivalent of uh, getting tons of things from the government without paying any taxes or something like that. Um, so just as it, in that case, it's always too good to be true and, you know, governments go bankrupt, maybe we'll find that compatibilism is something ban- it turns out to be bankrupt in the end. Um, all right, so before we, we kind of look at what compatibilism says, um, let's, let's kind of set the stage and uh, kind of give preliminary definitions of, of freedom and determinism. Um, because the, the issue of compatibilism really does hinge on how you define your terms, right? So this is where, to some extent, philosophy gets really, um, on the one hand, annoying, because it's just this kind of endless uh, reformulation of definitions and like, well, if we change it here, then, we, then it's compatible. So it really does depend on definitions. So sometimes it can kind of get frustrating, but unfortunately that's just the nature of the game, um, that things can get really, really trivial very fast. Um, but so we'll say freedom, or to be free, to have free will, is to have the ability to do otherwise uh, than how one acted. So as an example, um, even though probably when I wrote this it was true, but I didn't, I actually went out this weekend, so thank, you know, yay, I'm not a complete loser. (laughs) Um, But 
say, suppose that, you know, I actually did stay home. So I chose to stay home over the weekend. But it was a free choice because if I wanted to, I could have gone out, right? I had the ability to say, all right, you know what? You know, maybe all my friends have cool things to do. Well, you know, screw them. I'm going to go do something fun as well, like, you know, go to a bookstore. Um, So I could have done something differently. So it's a, it was a free choice to stay home because I could have, you know, done another action uh, if I had wanted to. That's why I, it was a free choice. Um, now, determinism, as we talked about last time, um, says something like, look, for every act or event to be determined is for it to basically be entailed by past events and the laws of nature. Um, so, as an example, uh, as a very pressing problem facing humanity, in six billion years, the earth will be destroyed by the sun, right? Now, we know that's true because we know the laws of nature and we know the kind of past events uh, and the, the, the kind of and, uh, the, the state of the universe at the current time and the past, Right, so we know how the sun is going to start to lose its energy, and in its quest of sucking in more fuel, it will expand to become a red giant. It will eventually boil the atmosphere of Earth and then eventually swallow it up. Um, so don't worry, you know, we'll be gone, but our future, the future humanity, it's, it's not good news for them. <laughs> um, so anyway, we could say, look, that future event is determined because... You have the past events and the laws of nature, and those are set. Right? Can't change those. So it's a determined event. So with these two definitions of freedom and determinism, the task for the compatibilist is to try to see how we can kind of reconcile the two, how we can bring the two together. So let's try to bring out uh, the apparent conflict to see where compatibilism uh, is able to to uh, give us a solution. So one way of thinking about freedom is kind of the metaphor of the garden of forking paths, right? So you're on you're on a path, and then you have a choice to make. And so the path that you're on then forks off into different alternatives. Now a free act would be one that okay maybe I'll take the left path maybe I'll take the right path you know maybe I'll take the path less traveled um, uh, but of course everyone travels down that path now after Robert Frost wrote the poem so it's not that well it's not that less traveled anymore um, didn't think about that Robert Frost did you um, <laughs> uh, so. Freedom, a free act would be one where nothing compels me to choose one path or the other. It's my own, it's, a, it's in my control to go down any one of those paths. But if determinism is true, then the path that I will go down is set because of my past choices and basically the laws governing my actions. Because again, I'm a physical system that's subject to the laws of nature. So it seems what determinism says is that the path that I will eventually choose has already been determined because of past events and laws of nature. So instead of the kind of multiple paths in front of me that I could take, I really can only take one of those because it's set down by the laws of nature. So the, the, uh, the illusion of free will comes in when I think I have these multiple paths but I'm just ignorant of the kind of underlying causes that will lead me to only one of those. All right? it's, our, it's our ignorance of all the factors that go into making a decision that leads us to believe. We have this wonderful garden of forking paths in front of us, but really, um, if determinism is true, supposedly, we have only one path to go down. So this is where you can kind of see the conflict. Real free will says... You can go down any of these, uh, these paths. Determinism says, even though it looks like you have the ability to go down all those paths, you actually will only go down one, and that was set long before you were, you were even confronted by the choice. 
right? So just think of it, you know, tomorrow you'll make a decision about something. It's already determined, right? Whatever you will do tomorrow, it's already true because of the past events, the laws of nature, and of course the, 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 the future choices that you make today, which are then in turn determined. So determinism seems to rule out this kind of freedom. And this is where the, the kind of conflict emerges. We have these two uh, attractive metaphors about um, free will and determinism, and you can see really where they just, they, they just one undermines the other. So we can kind of look first at a, a classic compatibilist uh, way of, of overcoming this dilemma. And again, we'll be looking at different ways of construing freedom that make it compatible with determinism. So in a way, you could say what they do is they come up with weaker versions of freedom. They, have, they, they weaken the, the definition of freedom in order to make it compatible with determinism. So the first kind of um, uh, way that a, determin- or a, a compatibilist may try to bring the two together is to say, look, all that's required for an act to be free is that it's carried out with some, without any kind of external constraint, and it's the result of some desire, right? So basically, to be free is to do what you want, and nothing compels you to do it. Um, so there's no, there's no need to mention alternative possibilities, right? I could have done differently, right? We can just kind of ignore that for now, because that idea of alternative possibilities, the forking paths metaphor is what seems to be ruled out by determinism. So if we get rid of that, that part of the definition of free will, then we can, we can try to then reconcile freedom and determinism. So, <clears throat> uh, consider the hypothetical case of John. So, John went to the movies, and the reason why John's act of going to the movies uh, it was free is because John wanted to go to the movies and nothing outside of him forced him to go, right? Nobody forced him to go. He didn't have a gun to his head. Nobody was, you know, holding his family for ransom. Like, if you don't go to the movie, you will, you know, your family will, will, will die. <laughs> Emma really liked that example. <laughs> um, so it, 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 it seems that this kind of notion of, of freedom is compatible with determinism. Um, because even if you know, my action is the result of uh, the past, uh, past events and the laws of nature, as long as I'm doing what I want and nothing external is imposing itself on me, then it's a free act. That's all. Um, so if this, what, if this is what freedom means, or to be free, then we can reconcile it with determinism. So this is at least, so the, this definition of freedom has drawbacks. So the first thing that's kind of important is just to, to kind of get a, a sense of how compatibilism works, or attempts of compatibilism work, this kind of redefinition of, of, of freedom uh, bringing in with determinism, so now they're compatible. But this, this kind of uh, first stab at constructing a compatible alternative kind of fails. Um, because you can kind of come up with uh, scenarios in which the, the, the definition is met perfectly well, but we would, we would not consider it a free act. So this is the other part of, of kind of the standard methodology of philosophy. Somebody comes up with a definition of freedom. They say, oh, like, here's what freedom means, and we can see how it's compatible with determinism. Then other philosophers come along and go, well, imagine this scenario, right? They give you a thought experiment or something in which the definition is met, but we wouldn't, you, we wouldn't say that person is free. So this is often how... Uh, the philosophical dialectic gets done. So, the, the kind of counterexample 
to, to the compatibilist would be, all right, think of John again. Now, John, the, the compatibilist said John's going to the movies with free act because John wanted to go to the movies and nothing external compelled him to go. But let's suppose that John suffers from a mental disorder that he's compelled to go to the movies, and we'll call it cinephilia. Um, don't know if that's a real disorder, but it's a good name. So maybe, I, I, like drug companies, that they create disorders to sell drugs. I've created a name, so we need to find actual disorder out in the world. Um, I'll write into the DSM and, and get them to put it in. So the whole idea is, even though John's doing what he wants to do, nothing external to him is compelling him to do it, but he's internally compelled, right? He has this disorder that kind of forces him to always want to go to the movie. So the whole idea is, would we consider John's act of going to the movie a free act? Is that an act in his control? And, I mean, this is an open question, right? So you may say, oh, there's no problem, right? I, I, I don't see why that rules out freedom. Um, but at least my kind of intuition says that would not be a, an example of, of a free act. So, I mean, and you can kind of see the practice. We do it all the time, right? We are more lenient with people who suffer from mental disorders if they commit a crime, because we realize the act or the crime that they committed was the result of a compulsion, not a free act, right? We hold people responsible. We punish them uh, much, much, uh, uh, much, much, much more strong if the act is an example of a, you know, a, a free decision. So somebody in John's position would be considered uh, Maybe not completely innocent if, you know, going to the movie caused a problem. You know, this is a dystopian future where art is banned and going to the movies is, you know, frowned upon. So, you know, we would, we would perhaps forgive John in this dystopian future for always trying to go see a movie because it's a compulsion rather than a free choice. Um, all right, so it seems, again, that the... the the thing that is lacking from this weaker version of freedom is that stipulation of the ability to do otherwise. Remember, we drop that in order to have a weaker definition of freedom to see if it can be compatible with determinism. So we can see why we might consider John's act to be unfree, because he didn't have the ability to do otherwise. His compulsion, his cinephilia, uh, stopped him from any other possible action. Um, and so it's, it seems that, that that aspect of his, 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 his choice is why we would perhaps intuit, to, to, intuit him as a determined rather than a free agent. He couldn't have done otherwise. Um, so even though we started off with this weaker definition, we come up with a counterexample in which it really doesn't, it's not sufficient for a free choice. And so we have to say, all right, we have to change our definition of freedom. We have to include something like a stipulation, um, the ability to do otherwise. So now we're back uh, at the kind of original problem, because it was, it was the ability to do otherwise that was in conflict with determinism. So we're, we were, we're kind of forced by the power of argument to reinstitute the, the, the ability to do otherwise clause. Um, so the next move for the compatibilist is to say, okay, there's a way of conceiving the ability to do otherwise that's not in conflict with determinism. And that's what uh, is often called the conditional analysis of the ability to do otherwise. Conditional is just a really fancy way of saying uh, if-then statements. Um, and this, this formulation is due to a, uh, uh, 
uh, kind of a well-known paper by R. E. Hobart. Um, it's it's kind of in. Usually, it's in all the uh, um, kind of collections of essays on free will. Um, so it's just you know, I'm not picking up straw man. This is a pretty good, uh, a pretty important paper. Um, so the the idea is, if we accept determinism as true, then this means, based on the definition of determinism, that the future events, including our actions, uh, must occur due to past events and the laws of nature. That's just a consequence of our definition of determinism. Um, But, and here's the compatibilist move, the truth of determinism is compatible with saying, and here's the conditional statement, if the past had been different, then so would the future. Right? So again, the future act is determined because of the laws of nature plus the past events. But if the past events had been different, then a future event would have been, uh, or the, the, the event that's determined in the, in the actual world may have turned out differently. Right? So to use the example of the earth being demolished by the sun, if the past events had been different, perhaps the, the formulation of the solar system, maybe the sun had a different... Uh, a different chemical composition. Um, it may not happen six billion years from now that the Earth will disappear. So, with this conditional analysis, um, we then can understand what it means for someone to have the ability to do otherwise. That's what we're trying to understand here. When somebody says, "I have the ability to do otherwise," what does that mean? Um, and the kind of original way of looking at it was something like the Garden of Forking Paths metaphor. But now, Hobart is giving us a different way of, of conceiving the ability to do otherwise. So, all it means on this version of compatibilism, to have the ability to do otherwise, is to say, had that someone wanted to do differently, then that someone would have done differently. So, John, even though he has cinephilia, if he had had to do something differently, right? If John didn't have cinephilia, then he would have been able to decide not to go to the movies. Or he he would have been like, you know what? Nothing's good this weekend. I'm going to stay home. So, even though John has this compulsion to go to the movies... If he had wanted to do something differently, he would have been able to do it. And that's why John, even though he has this compulsion, supposedly still has the ability to do otherwise. So this, again, is trying to, to re, kind of re-engineer uh, our understanding of this ability to make it fit with determinism. And that's pretty much the, the job of the compatibilist. Is this kind of re-engineering, redefinition of freedom in order to make it fit with determinism. Um, but we could say this is still a problematic conception of uh, having the ability to do otherwise. Because, in a sense, we want to say because John has this disorder, because John has this compulsion... He doesn't have the ability to do otherwise. That's why we consider him to have uh, a mental illness, right? He's, he, he does not have an ability that somebody else does who does not have cinephilia, right? So, you know, I hope no one here has cinephilia, but if, if you do, that's okay. Um, but the, we could say we have the ability to not go to the movies because we don't have this disorder. But it seems that John can't say that because he does have that disorder. Um, that, and, that, and all that means is that he cannot not want to go to the movies, right? He can never stop himself from that, 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 that drive, that incessant drive to go see a film. But it seems that the conditional analysis, if it's right, attributes to John the ability to not go to the movies. 
But that's exactly what his condition rules out. So, it seems that we're, this understanding of the ability to do otherwise leads to a contradiction. On the one hand, the conditional analysis says John has the ability to not go to the movies. Because if he had wanted to, and, you know, if, if the past state of events had been different, he might have just stayed home. In the sense of saying, you know, if John didn't have this disorder, he, he, he wouldn't have to go to the movies. So, according to the conditional analysis, John has the ability to, to not go to the movies. But, because John actually has cinephilia, he does not have the ability to stay home and not go to the movies. And so the whole idea is you can't have and not have the same ability. Right? That's a contradiction. So the conditional analysis doesn't seem to work for uh, somebody like John. And in that case, it doesn't really deliver the goods. Right? It doesn't deliver free will. Um, and again, you can could, you could see possibly why um, it doesn't deliver the goods is because it weakens the conception of what it means for somebody ha- to have the ability to do otherwise. Um, so, look, if we, if we reject kind of Hobart's analysis of the conditional analysis, uh, uh, um, the conditional analysis of the ability to do otherwise, then we're all the way back to the original conflict of how to square determinism with uh, freedom. Um, now, look, this is only meant to be kind of a really brief introduction at, uh, of how some have tried to make compatibilism uh, work, how some have tried to make determinism compatible with free will. There's tons of other uh, philosophers out there that have their own unique definitions, and we could take the whole semester looking through them all, right? So um, uh, some of you may be familiar with Daniel Dennett. He's a pretty well-known compatibilist. Um, he has a couple of books uh, on the subject, Elbow Room, Freedom Evolves. Um, there, uh, uh, the Stanford Cyclopedia... Uh, philosophy has a good entry on compatibilism, and it kind of goes through tons of other formulations about uh, uh, about compatibilism. So, you know, don't don't take away this like we have definitively refuted compatibilism. No, it's just it's just a taste of how they try to work uh, determinism and freedom together, and ways of trying to to kind of question that to see, to, to to figure out whether or not it works. And that's the whole idea of trying to imagine counter instances and see whether or not you would say it's free will. Um, But let's turn our attention now to those who think that free will is incompatible with determinism. So we'll leave the compatibilists and look at the kind of a direct argument for incompatibilism. So that's what we'll do next. We'll look at the incompatibilist position. Um... So, the incompatibilist, I mean, the incompatibilist could just do a completely negative program, right? So, every time the compatibilist tries to square um, the circle of free will and determinism, the incompatibilist could just say, doesn't work, here's why, next, right? So, they, the incompatibilist could just be a purely negative position of saying, look, compatibilism just doesn't work. But the incompatibilist uh, also tries to provide a positive argument in favor of incompatibilism. So it's not just purely, look, compatibilism, none of your, work, none of your ideas work. Here's an actual positive one. So it's, the kind of, it's like the difference between negative arguments for the existence of God versus positive arguments for the non-existence of God. So the negative approach would just say, look, you know, all the arguments that have been posited in favor of the existence of God don't work. But then the positive case is uh, arguments that actively try to, to, to prove the non-existence of God. So the, like, the argument from evil is, is taken to be a, a positive argument uh, in favor of the non-existence of God. Whereas disagreeing with, say, the ontological, cosmological argument from design, those are just negative 
um, uh, negative uh, strategies against uh, a theist. Um, so the, the kind of incompatibilist for their positive position uh, needs to set down where exactly there is an incompatibility, an incompatibility right? Um, and the argument that we'll look at today um, is called the consequence argument. And it's probably been one of the more influential of the incompatibilist arguments. Um, so the version of the consequence argument we'll be looking at uh, is formulated by a, an American philosopher from the University of Notre Dame, um, or Notre Dame, uh, called Peter Van Inwagen. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure he came up with the, the argument, or at least he named it the consequence argument, which in philosophy is often why you get credit for what you do. So even though you know, probably tons of people in the past have come up with the idea, you give it a name, it's yours. Um, it's a very, <laughs> it's a kind of a low-hanging fruit. Um, so here's, a, here's kind of a quote from uh, a, his book called An Essay on Free Will um, that he kind of sets out the basic argument. So if determinism is true, then our acts and the consequences of the laws of nature and events in the remote past. Uh, our acts are the consequences, sorry, forgot the verb, um, are the consequences of the laws of nature and events in the remote past. And this is, of course, what we've been saying about, that's just the definition of determinism. Um, and here's where the argument comes in. But it is not up to us what went on before we, we were born. And neither is it up to us what the laws of nature are. Therefore, the consequences of these things, including our present acts, the consequences of the laws of nature plus past events, are not up to us. So the whole idea is, if our actions are not up to us, then how could we say they're free actions? Because usually when you say, okay, that was a free choice, that wasn't, the, the, the thing that distinguishes that, the free act from the non-free act is that the free act was up to you, and the compelled act was not up to you. So again, if you think of, 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 of John's disorder, the reason why we would say it's not a free act is because it's not up to him to choose to go to the movie, because he has this compulsion to go. Whereas somebody without the disorder, going to the movie is up to them because uh, it was in their control to, to either go to the movie or not. But the consequence argument is basically saying, whatever act you choose, right? so whatever happens in the next you know, 30 seconds to the rest of your life, it's not up to you. You didn't choose anything. Because everything is a result of the past events, and the laws of nature. So, just to get clear, to get a little clearer on what he means by the laws of nature, um, for Van Einwagen, the laws of nature are something metaphysical, that is, there's something real in the world, and they do not depend on our knowledge of them. Right? So the whole idea is, even though, um, you know, it took until, say, Newton and then later on Einstein, to formulate the, the mathematical equations that determine uh, or, or describe the, uh, the law of gravity, there was still gravity before anybody came along to think up the uh, idea of gravity. So the existence of the laws of nature don't depend on our knowledge of it. Now, that's kind of an important statement because some people could argue, well, of course we have control over the laws of nature because, you know, we're the ones who brought it into existence in the first place. There weren't laws of nature until we described them, formulated mathematical rules, and everything else. Um, so there was no gravity until Newton came up with his formula. Um, and, it's, and he basically says, look, just in the same way that stars don't exist 
because there are astronomers looking at them, right? Those stars are there, you know, we just happen to see them through a telescope the same way. The laws of nature are there, we just happen to describe them with uh, mathematical formalism. Um, But in a way, the laws of nature are different than stars. There's something even stronger about their independence from us. Because, you know, in some wild sci-fi example, and this is another favorite tool of philosophers, is coming up with crazy sci-fi examples. It's, it's almost like writing fiction. Um, that, say again, the sun, take the sun. The sun is going to extinguish in six billion years. Suppose that by that time, our understanding of celestial mechanics becomes so advanced that we could kind of stop the sun from expanding and swallowing the earth. Now, it's unlikely that that'll happen. But the whole idea is, it's possible. And the reason why it's possible is because we're not violating any laws of nature. And that's where you have the difference between, say, the independence of stars from the independence of the laws of nature. We can't change the law of nature at all, right? Because we are, very, we are subject to the laws of nature. You can't kind of like stand beyond the laws of nature to change the laws of nature and then subject yourself once again. You can't change gravity. You can't change electromagnetism because it's the very condition of your existence. Um, so look, no, there's no amount of technological advancement that we could change a law of nature, right? We can exploit the laws of nature, but we can't change them. So laws of nature, the laws of nature pose limits on our ability to do certain things, right? <clears throat> I mean, this is just a more or less a pretty kind of uh, uh, common, commonsensical picture. You know, we may, de- we may deem certain things impossible because we think it violates a law of nature, and that may prove wrong in the future, right? So say flying. Somebody at one point in time may have said, oh, look, flying is impossible. It violates the law of nature, right? It violates gravity for humans, right? Birds can do it, but humans can't. But, you know, well, we showed them, right? We Now we can fly, at least in an airplane. Um, but we haven't violated a law of nature because of that, right? We haven't changed gravity. Um, we haven't changed who we are. We were just wrong initially, Right? So we haven't changed anything about the law of nature. We've changed something about our knowledge. So that's not an example of changing anything about the law of nature. So we can kind of uh, put, put the elements together in, in kind of a schematic form in the kind of consequence argument. So again, every action equals the law of nature, the laws of nature plus past events. That's, again, just the definition of determinism that we all kind of agree on. Then, the second kind of assumption or premise is free will is something like having the ability to do otherwise, you know, uh, or, you know, things being up to us, as, as, using the language of Annie Wagon. Um, and what does it mean to have this ability to do otherwise? What does it mean for things to be up to us? Uh, that means that for any action, any action that you take, uh, you could have done the opposite action. Now, you could have done something different, but you could have done some... You, just to, to bring out the stark contrast, let's just say the opposite action. Um, but again, every action, as specified by determinism, uh, determines is determined by the laws of nature and past events. So for this other action to be really up to you, right? for you to have had this ability to do otherwise um, would mean you either had to change the laws of nature or the past events. But we have to admit, I cannot change the laws of nature as we just discussed, nor can I change past events. Therefore, I could not have done the opposite action. But if I cannot do the opposite action, 
then I don't have the ability to do otherwise. And if I don't have the ability to do otherwise, I have no free will. So every action that I do, it's not up to me. And that's just, a, again, a basic consequence of uh, if we accept determinism. Again, the incompatibilist position is something of a hypothetical. When the incompatibilist is arguing against the compatibility of determinism and free will, the incompatibilist is not saying determinism is true. All the incompatibilist has to say is, look, if determinism is true, right, if it does turn out to be true, it's incompatible with free will. So that's why the first premise kind of starts with like, this basically the definition of determinism. So let's accept that determinism is true and see what happens. And the force of the argument comes from the fact that we all more or less agree to the starting premises. And that's, and that's always what makes a good argument. A good argument is one where you basically agree to the premises and insofar it's valid that the conclusion follows from the premises, then you have to accept the conclusion no matter how much you may hate it, right? Um, so we may, we may really not want to give up the belief in free will, but if we agree to the kind of premises that Van Anwagen says, we have to conclude that none of our actions are up to us. So it's a really kind of basic argument. Um, but, and, and to some extent, with all good arguments, it's, it's kind of simple. But the conclusion is quite striking. Um, and that's where kind of people have this immediate reaction of, no, there, there's something, something's going wrong. Um, so to kind of put the argument in, in, in much simpler terms, since we cannot change the past and the laws of nature, then we cannot change the future because the future is entailed by the past and the laws of nature. So most people would say, look, tomorrow hasn't happened. It's up to me what goes on, right? Maybe I'll come to class. Maybe I won't. I won't. Maybe I'll go out, go to you know, the beach or something, although it'll be pretty, pretty cold. Maybe I go to Vic Market instead. Um, but the consequence, consequence argument basically says, look, those actions tomorrow are not up to you because, again, they're just a consequence of the laws of nature plus past events. Um, another way you could say it is we don't have the capacity to render false propositions about the future, right? So, you know, say the statement, I go to Vic Market tomorrow is true. Um, I don't have the ability to render that false because that would mean I would have to either be able to violate a law of nature or change a past event. I can do neither of those, so I can't make that statement false. It's true. It's true right now. That, you know, I don't know whether or not it's true, but it's still, it, it's either true or false. Um, and that's all that it means, right? So we can't, again, confuse our ignorance about a future event for its metaphysical uh, kind of indeterminacy. So determinism, according to the consequence argument, rules out um, certain abilities, this ability to do otherwise, choices being up to us, that are necessary for the existence of free will. So what the consequence argument is saying, look, here are certain kind of key points for any definition of freedom. If you don't have these points, you don't have free will. And then what the consequence argument shows is the truth of determinism rules out those kind of essential components to any definition of freedom. Right? You can kind of add on, take away whatever you want for the definition of freedom, but if you don't have these components, this kind of ability to do otherwise, or actions being up to you, then you're kind of deluding yourself and thinking it's really freedom. Um, so the consequence argument, again, is meant to show if determinism is true, then free will does not exist. And that's all it's trying to prove. It's not trying to prove 
the truth of determinism. It's just trying to prove this conditional. So again, it's up to the, the, the sciences to figure out whether or not determinism is true. Once we know that, we can, we can know whether or not the consequence argument goes through. Um, all the consequence argument is trying to prove is the conditional. If determinism is true, then free will does not exist. That's all it's trying to, to, to justify. Um, so again, if the, if, if the consequence argument is, is sound, then it seems that determinism and uh, free will are incompatible. Um, now, of course, you know, as with any pretty influential argument, uh, it's garnered a huge amount of literature in the free will debate. So tons of people have said, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's a bad argument, or, um, you know, like a libertarian, look, determinism isn't true, so it doesn't really matter. So, you know, I can't really go down all the nuances about ways of responding to it, but there are kind of a huge amount of literature out there that discusses this, this problem. Um, so it's just kind of to give you a flavor of both how compatibilists try to do what they do and how incompatibilists try to do what they do. Um, and that's it for free will. <laughs>